here's the awesome thing we get to do right now. Learn the word of God together. So let's open to Psalm chapter 19 as we get started this morning. Psalm chapter 19. I love to get to pray the Psalms as I've been saying for for a while now. I would love for you guys to get to do this when we open the building. So make sure like if you want to come up and pray a Psalm over the service before we get started, I would love to have the congregation do that. Just email me drew.carroll at surprise.church. I would love to have you guys do that. Pray on that. Consider that. Um, it, it would be an awesome thing to have the whole congregation praying together. But we're in Psalm 19 today, and it says this in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. <laughs> there are no words, their voice is not heard, their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, it is like a bridegroom coming from his home, it rejoices like an athlete running a course, it rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other end, nothing is hidden from its heat. Let's pray. God, it is an amazing truth. The whole world proclaims the glory of Jesus. The sun, the moon, the stars, every inch of this planet, God, it is preaching always about you. And yet, they never say a word. And instead, Lord, it is solely their obedience, God. It is solely that the sun goes exactly where you tell it to go and the moon goes exactly where you tell it to go and the wind blows where you tell it to go and the rivers flow where you tell them to go. God, in every bit of this planet is obedient to your command. Every inch of the universe obeys your word and it is a testimony, God, to you and your goodness. We continue in the psalm. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, verse 7. Renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me, then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord my rock, and my redeemer. God, as Brian, Pastor Brian put so well, as Brad put so well, God, let us be honest with our sin. For Lord, unlike the sun and the moon and the stars and the rivers and the valleys and the mountains, God, unlike them, we disobey your command every day. God, those things that you have made and crafted by your hands, they hear your voice and they obey immediately and with joy and they go and they seek exactly what you have called them to do. And Lord, they, they are a glorious shining light for you and who you are. But we who say we follow you, we so often fail. God, we hear your word and it is righteous and it is true and it is good. And then we run towards idols and false things. God, and when we disobey you, when we rebel against you, we don't show the world your light, God. We shine darkness instead. God, help us to be a people who love you so much, who trust your word inside and out that we obey always, God. But let us also recognize our flaws. Let us be so real in confession, God, that we confess sins we don't even know we committed. God, that we say, I don't even know all my faults. I don't know all my sins. It's unintentional sin. I still confess. I just love you so much. And every moment of every day we live gospel-centered for you. Trusting Jesus with our whole heart. 
Cleanse us, Lord. Give us a new spirit, a spirit that seeks you always. Amen. Today, we are in Matthew chapter 3. You can go ahead and go there. And I have one thought for today's sermon. Just one. When Jesus comes, it changes everything. When Jesus comes, it changes everything. I know for many of you, you have an amazing testimony of that moment in your life when Jesus came and changed everything for you. I know for me, I've shared my story on a number of occasions, but I don't think I could share it enough because for me, when Jesus came into my life, he changed everything. You know, as a young man, I I was raised in the church. My parents, who I love so much, did everything they could to raise me well in the faith. They brought me to church. They had me going to youth group. They had me connected. But there was always just this strange disconnect. And I felt like I knew the Lord, but in reality, I just knew about the Lord, right? I was constantly surrounded by the Lord. I was, I was at church with my mom who worked in children's ministry at a church. And so I was there all the time. And, and, and I was around so many pastors and leaders and friends and everybody I knew went to church. And I was around the church environment my whole life. So I knew all about the Lord. I had heard countless sermon after sermon after sermon about God. But I had never known the Lord. I knew about the Lord. And when I got to college, as I know so many young people have this experience, and I'm so passionate about meeting with the students and the young people in our church in this place, because it's where I was, but you go to college and all of a sudden you're getting challenged over and over. And I actually think it happens younger now. If you have young high school students, junior high students, I promise you, at school, online, they are being challenged over and over and over again about their faith. There's over and over. And the weight of the challenge and the burden, right? I had a professor in my mythology class. He told us week after week, the Bible is just a bunch of made up stories. It's a bunch of myths and I can prove it. And he would go and he would talk about the Hebrew and how it was written. He would talk about the Greek and how it was written. And he would talk about how the stories came together. And and I knew none of this. (laughs) <laughs> right? And he was just breaking down my worldview. All of a sudden, things were falling apart around me. I had no clue what was going on. I became untethered. I wouldn't say that I was an atheist or anything along those lines, but I was just a Christian kind of pretending to be a Christian, right? I, was, I had hope that God was real. I had hope he might be there, but in reality, it was kind of, I had so many questions. There wasn't any real trust there. And I remember just the brokenness I, I talk with my wife about this uh, all the time. She's had a different experience than I have. She, she tells me she's known the Lord her whole life, and I believe her uh, because John here in our story, right, he, he has the spirit while he's in the womb. It's such a powerful and amazing thing, but he's walked with the Lord day one, right out as a baby. And, and, and so my wife has a different experience than me, but for me, it was, it was just this walking in darkness. And I, and I think of that time, and I, it's like I'm, I'm, I have someone else's memory. It's so strange. I think back and I'm like, I have no clue who that person was. But I'm not that person now. But thinking back into that time, it was just, it was so confusing and and hard and, and painful. And there was broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship. And I remember after just a terrible day, let me tell you, it was awful. I was just sitting alone in my car just weeping by myself. And in that moment, it just stopped. And I started to just confess to the Lord. Just over and over. And I can't tell you how long I was there, but I might have said I'm sorry to God like a hundred times, a thousand times, 10,000 times. I just sat there in my car crying and saying I am sorry over and over and just saying everything that came to my heart, everything that came to my mind, all the brokenness, all the pain. And it wasn't in a church. It wasn't in a small group. It wasn't in a Bible study. It wasn't listening to worship music. It wasn't any of that. I was alone by myself in a car with nobody, estranged from God. And in that moment, Jesus came and changed everything. And I remember the journey from there. I've expressed many times I had a crippling pornography addiction that was just 
just tearing my heart and my mind to shreds. I, I, it, was, it was just one of the most horrible things and actually one of the most amazing blessings that I've had in, in my seminary experiences. One of the projects we had was going to my wife and, and I had to write a sexual history my whole life. Every sexual thought and interaction I could think of that I've ever had, I had to write it out and give it to her and have her read it <laughs> and talk together about it. And it was, it was just one of those experiences and I, and I remember the thought of like, I just never knew, like when I got into my marriage, was my life sexually ever going to be right? Was it ever going to be pure? Was it ever going to be true? Was it ever going to be honoring to God? Because I was so in this mode of brokenness at one point in my life. But when I came to know Jesus, it changed everything. And it wasn't like that went away overnight, but instead I didn't just look at my sin like I did before, where I was praying to God and I was saying, God, I want forgiveness. And then I'd turn around and go right back to it. I was coming to God and saying, really, I don't want to go to hell, but I don't want to let this go. And I was telling God, you got to forgive me because I'm not willing to let my sin go, but I don't want to go to that other place. And in reality, I just held on tighter and tighter. But now when I was saved, when I finally knew the Lord, I was able to let go and say, God, forgive me and help me grow past it. And, and just battle after battle, stumble after stumble. The Lord has provided healing and walked me through it. I remember in that time, I was super obsessed with politics. It was all I did, and I'm not criticizing you if you love politics, but the reality is it was poisoning me. It was an illness. All I could think about was Republican, Democrat. I was watching video after video, news source after news source, like one speaker after another, and I was so addicted to it and filling my life with it, and I learned to hate people. I learned to hate my neighbor because they are from the opposite side, and they're trying to destroy my country, and I need to hate that person, and it filled me with such vileness and anger and hatred, and the Lord said, no, it's me you need to care about. It's not your country, it's not your party, it's me and it's my name and it's my glory that needs to shine in the whole world, not just in the U.S., but in the whole world. Slowly I was able to heal from the anger and the hatred and as I moved forward and moved forward, God called me one step further and one step further, be an intern, be a youth pastor, be a family pastor, be a lead pastor and all the way to where I am before you. But I have to tell you, it's so strange, God changed everything. When Jesus came, he changed it all for me. Today, we get the glorious story. The whole Old Testament has been leading up to it. Every prophet, every statement, every bit of what God is doing in creation has led to this moment. Matthew chapter 3, as John is on the scene and this verse comes, right in verse 3, 13, it says this, what? Then Jesus came. All of that's back there. Then Jesus came. Let's read it together. Matthew 3, verse 13. It says this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him saying, and <laughs> this is so right on, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? Jesus answered him, Allow it for now. I love that, by the way. The for now part of it, right? Allow it for now. <laughs> for now. Because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. And I love this too. Then John, what? Allowed him to be baptized, right? John gave Jesus permission to get baptized. Uh, I love that. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water and the heavens suddenly opened for him. He saw the Spirit of God. I want you to picture this for a moment. Please do. He's in the water, right? He comes up and the heavens split open. Like this is crazy. This is amazing. And the Spirit comes down like a dove onto him. And a voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This is crazy, amazing moment. God literally splits open the heavens and speaks verbally, out loud, so everyone can hear it. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. One of the few times in the Bible we're going to see an event like this. Let's go through it passage by passage. In verse 13, right, Jesus comes. We've been building up to this moment for weeks. 
This is the guy that John was saying last weekend, right? I'm not worthy to even take off this guy's sandals. I'm baptizing you with water. He's going to baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. This is this guy that's coming along. He's been prophesied from the very beginning. And we talked about how Matthew is telling us, right, through that Isaiah passage, prepare the way and make the path straight for the Lord. This isn't just some guy. This is God. The Lord is coming. And in this moment, right, the Lord is coming. All of a sudden, the story just shifts away from John, and it says, then Jesus came. (laughs) The Lord is here. The Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the promised one, the Son of God, comes. And this moment is so awesome. And it does not disappoint. The Lord of Lord comes. And immediately, right, in, in, in John 14, or sorry, Matthew 3, 14, John says this, right? John tried to stop him from getting baptized. He said, no, don't do that. I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. The power of that statement. That is the heart of someone who recognizes who Jesus is. God, you come to me, I'm supposed to be going to you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, right? For the righteous. Jesus comes for us long before we ever even think about coming for him. And in this moment, God comes to John, and John is saying, why in the world would you want to be baptized by a guy like me? I'm supposed to be being baptized by you. John recognizes a powerful truth, right? Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than he could ever imagine. He's greater than him, greater than anyone that came before. And he recognizes, right, he baptizes with water, but Jesus is coming to baptize with spirit and with fire. And he's like, this guy needs to baptize me. In verse 15, Jesus answers him, though. He answers his protest by explaining him, to him, this is how we're going to fulfill all righteousness. And you may say that's kind of a, a strange phrase, right? It, it is kind of weird. And it's like, what is exactly Jesus meaning here when he says, fulfill all righteousness in this moment? I think a big part of this, right, We talked about how John is a prophet, right? Like the Old Testament prophets, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and and, and all these guys, right? In the Old Testament, John is like that. He's a prophet in that line. He's somebody that God has come to and given a message and says, go out and prepare the way for the Lord. Jesus comes to be baptized by John to show. He's not just some guy coming onto the scene out of nowhere. No, this is the one who all the prophets have been talking about all the way down the line. And John is this last one, right? He's this last marker for Jesus. And Jesus is saying, baptize me so we can fulfill all of what has been laid out. All righteousness. And so Jesus is baptized in this moment. But there's something else That's more powerful, right? Remember that John's baptism is for the confession of sins, right? It's for the the healing of sins. Well, why does Jesus need to receive a baptism that's for sins? He doesn't need to. He's perfect. He's blameless. So instead of Jesus coming, there's this powerful moment. Instead of Jesus coming to receive baptism for his own sin, he receives baptism for you and me and our sin. And I'll show that a little bit more as we come down the road here. And then we see the moment, right? Verse 16, Jesus was baptized and immediately he comes up from the water and the heavens split open and he sees the spirit of God descending like a dove coming down on him and a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son with who I am well pleased. This is an amazing moment. The fullness of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit all present in one moment all for the baptism of Jesus. And naturally, we have to ask the question, right? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. What does it mean for God to be well pleased with the son? I want to go through a few passages from that Old Testament history that Jesus is fulfilling. Come with me first to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. And let's go to verse 1 together. We're going to go 1 through 9. 
of Isaiah 42, 1 through 9. It says this, way back, right? Old Testament prophet talking about a future event. This is God speaking through Isaiah. He says, this is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him, right? So you see that language. This is my servant who I'm well pleased. My son who I'm well pleased. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. You see that, right? The dove coming down from heaven, resting on Jesus. I put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed. He will not put out a smoldering wick. He will faithfully bring justice. He will not grow weak or be discouraged until he has established justice on the earth. The coasts and islands will wait for his instruction. This is what God, the Lord says, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I am the Lord. I have called you for a righteous purpose and I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you and I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nation. In order to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. The past events have indeed happened. Hear the Lord. Now I declare new events. I announced them to you before they occur. (laughs) The power, right? In Isaiah, he's laying out Jesus' baptism. He's laying out this moment. God's telling us long before it ever happened, this is exactly what's going to happen. When it does, you're going to know that I am God. But there's an amazing moment as well where he says, I am not going to give my glory to another or my praise to idols in verse 8. What is he saying? In this moment where God declares, this is my son and who I'm well pleased, he's telling us, all of us, this isn't an idol. This isn't a false person to worship. This is my son. This is whom I have determined will be my servant who will receive glory and honor and power. God is telling us, guys, this is the one. The one you can cling your life to the one you can trust in 100%, the one you can give everything to, the one you can call Lord, the one you can call Savior, the one you can call King, the one who's gonna change everything. This is him. Let's go to one more place in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter three. Malachi chapter three. Go to your end of your Old Testament, basically. And I can't get there because it's not my Bible. I stole Brian's Bible today, in case you didn't notice. Uh, you know, his Bible's all beat up, you know, because he's cruel to it for some reason. But uh, <laughs> Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, says this. See, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. You see that? There it again, remember, right there, John. Voice cry out in the wilderness, make my path straight, right? He's going to clear the way before me. So who's this speaking, by the way? Is this Jesus speaking? I'm going to send my messenger. He's going to clear the way before me. Could be. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. This is an amazing thing, by the way. We're going to see Jesus enter the temple soon. It's the fulfillment of this right here. The Lord is going to walk into the temple. And when he does, it's not so pretty, but uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Verse 2, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and like launderer's bleach. I love that passage. But remember John, right? What did he say? He's going to come and he's going to baptize with spirit and with fire. Here's the Lord saying he's going to come and he's going to bring fire and like bleach, right? Cleaning clothes. He will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem, hear this, right? My son in whom I'm well pleased, they will please the Lord as in the days of old and years gone by. So in these two passages, right, we see that God has been telling us about this moment. 
He's been expressing to us, my servant is gonna come onto the scene. And when he does, he's gonna be a purifying fire, a refiner. He's gonna, be, uh, he's gonna bring justice to the nations. He's gonna not just yell in the streets, but he's going to actually heal and provide for broken people. That is Jesus. In this moment, we see God expressing that to us. This is the son. He is the one with whom I am well pleased. There's one a little deeper thing. It's a little bit of a Drew nerd theory here, so I don't know this for sure. But just come with me on the ride, all right? We know from Paul's writings that baptism, right, it symbolizes death, right? He tells us in Romans, right, we're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into his death. That's why you go under the water. It's like being buried in a grave, right? You're being baptized. You're being put on, in the grave under the water. And then when you come back up, It's the resurrection, right? You've been raised with Christ. And it's a symbol of that day when Jesus comes back and he brings us out of the grave and he raises us up to be with him. I think there is a moment here in Jesus receiving baptism that he is offering himself as the sacrifice to the Lord that would pay for sin. And the Lord in saying, this is my son and who I am well pleased is accepting that sacrifice, that offering. You see, because in baptism, we are unified to Christ in his death. And we are brought up with him in his resurrection. And in this moment, Jesus is saying, I am willing to die and be raised. And God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus, in this moment, he doesn't need baptism for the forgiveness of his sins But he receives it for you and for me. In this moment, Jesus takes on of all the people who are going to come to have faith in him, he takes on and he accepts that sin and that death and that weight from their brokenness and he takes it on himself and the Lord says, this is my son. This is the one. I love this passage. (laughs) Let's get into our lessons for disciples. First one, my main point of this sermon. Jesus coming changes everything. Jesus coming changes everything. From this moment on, for the rest of of history, right, everything has changed. The Lord has come, the Messiah, the King of kings, God of gods. He has come. He's become one of us to die for us, to be raised again. God has come. This is the beautiful message of the gospel. The gospel that we say, right, that we're gospel-centered. This is the message, that God has come to pay for our sins, to die for us, and to raise us from the dead. He has come to make us new, to, clean, to cleanse us, to, to refine us like a fire, to, to clean us like bleach cleaning clothes, right, to wash us as white as snow. This is the guy, and everything's changed. Maybe you're like me, and you have a moment And I love what Brian talked about, by the way. It's exactly right. It's not just that moment, but it's every moment after that where you're walking saved with the Lord, right? But maybe you had this moment where Jesus came and changed everything. And from then on, you couldn't look back. You can't turn around. You know the Lord, and it has changed everything. I'm gonna ask you guys to do something. I've never done this before, I don't think. This will be the first time I've ever done this. It makes me feel a little weird because I'm a millennial and, you know, people, I, I just feel like I'm going to get picked on for saying hashtag anything. So, uh, you know, save the emails, okay? I don't need them. Uh, but <laughs> here's my challenge to you. I think this would be awesome and I want to hear it from you. All right? I want you guys to go on to your social media page, whatever it is, And one of our values here as a church is stories matter. And I want you to tell your story. I want you to tell your story about how Jesus came and changed everything for you. Just write it out. That's one of the most powerful and amazing things for your friends, for your family, for your coworkers, for those who are in your life to hear. To hear how Jesus came for you and changed everything. And I want you to go on. And I want you to hashtag it, okay? Hashtag, all right? Just very simple. Jesus came. That's it. Hashtag Jesus came. That's all. 
And, and I want you to put that on your social media. I want you to tag us, Surprise Christian Church, because I would love to go and read them. I would love to post them on our page, on all our stories and things like that, so people can read them in our church. But I personally want to read them. Uh, so add us, make sure you do that. But if you don't have social media, email me. I'm so serious. I want to hear how Jesus changed your life. Email me, drew.carroll at surprise.church if you don't have social media, and tell me Jesus came and changed everything. I want to hear your story. It matters. The world needs to hear it. It's what it means to be gospel-centered, to express how Jesus has come into your life and changed everything. Here's point number two. We need Jesus. Well, let me, I could just stop there, <laughs> really. But we need Jesus to be a sacrificial offering in our place. We're coming up on Easter here pretty soon. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think can get so lost, just like it does in the Christmas season, um, one of the things that can get so lost is just the meaning of why we do it. Get so distracted by eggs and parties and going to church and all these things that we just totally miss the purpose. But the reality is Easter is a celebration of the resurrection of our Lord, but before he had to be raised, he had to die, right? And we have to, as Christians, we have to take a moment to dwell and to just simply think, why? Why did Jesus have to die, right? You know, I think a lot of times we miss it because we go, well, it's great, and he came, and he and he saves us, and he, he, he was, you know, for us, and he raised from the dead, and all this stuff. But why did he have to die? God doesn't do things arbitrarily, right? It wasn't like there was another way. And I think often we think that God should just go, all right, everybody's good. <laughs> you know, you've done all this bad stuff, you've done all these evil things, but you're good. Come on into heaven. And that's how we want God to behave. But Jesus died. And he didn't die for no reason. He, got, he died because God, the Father, asked him to. He asked him to. And Jesus humbly went to the cross in obedience to the Father. He was tortured. He was spit on. He was kicked and beaten and bloodied and ripped open, crucified to a cross, and he slowly suffocated to death. And if you don't look at that and go, why? And come to the realization that you're why. You're missing it. Jesus went to the cross because you put him there. And so did I. Every moment of sin, every moment of rebellion, every moment, that's why Jesus is on the cross. And while he's suffering and dying, he's doing so because of you. And the most amazing thing about that, he's doing it because he wanted to. He didn't owe it to us. He didn't have to do it. He could have left you and me in our sin. He could have said, fine, you want to rebel? That's fine. There's consequences. The reality is God would have been no less loving, no less good, no less God, had in the flood, had he wiped out everyone and not saved Noah. God would have been no less loving and no less good and no less God if he had said to all of us, you've sinned, you've fallen, deal with the consequences. But simply, out of the goodness of who he is, God decided to sacrifice his son and he did it for you and for me. That should let you realize Jesus coming changes but we can't miss this final piece. This final lesson for disciple. We cannot miss. Jesus did not just come to pay for our sins, but to purify us with fire. He didn't just come to die. He came to live. He came to live, and he came to die, and he came to rise again. And he lives now on the throne. And his call to you and to me, as people who say, I believe in you, I trust in you, Jesus, the call of the Christian life is the call of light, not darkness, holiness, not wickedness, good, not evil, purity, not sin, and love, not hate. We are called, my friend, to be refined, to be made new, to be made 
beautiful, to be, to be washed white as snow, to live a life that is honoring and glorifying to God. And he doesn't leave us alone to do it. He gave us the spirit, the same spirit that falls on Jesus at his baptism, the same spirit that's going to lead him into the wilderness in the next chapter, the same spirit that he cast out demons and healed people and did amazing things. That same spirit, that spirit is given to you and to me so that we can overcome. We're going to go into a new series next week, not a new series, a sub-series. We're doing gospel-centered for a long time, but within that there will be some sub-series, so it's going to be gospel-centered But this new series is titled Going to War. Because in this next passage, which I'm so excited about, Jesus goes to war against the devil and his kingdom. And he gives us the tools. He equips us right with the spirit just to follow his example. But God calls us to a life that honors him. I just want to close here. I read the psalm at the beginning of the day, right? The sun and the moon and the stars, they obey God and they're constantly preaching of his goodness. My friends, if we're going to be gospel-centered, if we're actually going to go out in this community right outside these doors and we're going to tell them about who Jesus is and what he's done, we have to answer the call of obedience. We have to answer the call of obedience. We have to hear God for what he's saying. We have to learn from his word. We have to work with the spirit on changing and transforming our lives. We have to obey the call of the Lord because the reality is when you live in darkness, you preach darkness. And when you live in good light, the light of Jesus, you preach Jesus. And friends, if the sun, moon, and stars can preach Jesus without saying a single word just by their obedience, you and I can do the same and should do the same. Let us seek the goodness of who God is every day so that the world will hear our story, hear who Jesus is, and realize Jesus changes everything. Have a great week. I look forward to seeing you guys next weekend.